Good job, guys. They say that uh, though there's only two things people really hate. If you're gonna lead people, you need to understand what they love and what they hate. Now, what they love is, is very. It was from Alabama football to uh, other types of football. Anybody might love anything. What they hate is only two things. They hate change and they hate the way things are, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, all that nervous time is true. We all hate change and we hate the way things are. Or at least those people out there do. Not us, but those people out there. What does that do? It breeds cynicism. It breeds cynicism in your heart, my soul. It breeds cynicism in our community. It breeds cynicism in our world. Because there just is a lot of that. And there's always been a lot of that. Human nature is nothing new. Human nature has been constant for however long we've been here. But now, everybody's got a voice. And, and there's no discrimination, which is a good thing. For the first time, you know, the poor man has the same voice as the rich man. And, and the black has the same voice as the white and male and female. They're, there's no discrimination. Everybody has a voice through this beautiful invention called social media that is really only about 15 years old. And so it was a great leveling in society. Some discrimination, however, is good. And in that great society, in that new wild west that we have called social media where everybody's got a voice, we also don't discriminate based on people's comprehension of reality. Their IQ, <laughs> their psychosis, or their lack thereof. And we have to deal with that. And what does that breed? That breeds cynicism. I mean, in your businesses, you deal with it. You deal with the, the Google review, the, the Facebook bomb that lands on your page that's so far removed from reality. I mean, sometimes it's real, we need to deal with it. Sometimes it is miles from reality, and you can't really address it, can you? It's not in the public sphere. I just breed more cynicism. And so in this new environment of cynicism, as leaders, we have to be careful, but we have to navigate the waters, else we just see all the future to internet trolls, to Twitter bombs, to the Kardashian way of life, you know, to this, to this sense of everybody's gonna leverage their voice and everybody's gonna second guess every opinion, every decision, ever made, where activism is low and slacktivism is high, right? I had to explain to my daughter, who's actually 21, what slacktivism is. Slacktivism is the people sitting on their couches, eating Twinkies, hitting share in life, thinking they're changing the world. They're just gaining weight. <laughs> You're not going to move the dial that way. But it feels good. Like I shared it like that. That's going to change the outcome of this election is going to change the outcome of our future. No, it's probably not. But it feels good because cynicism is in my life and it's in yours. And I'll tell you, it, it breeds in our lives because it feels like we're actually accomplishing something. It feels good. I'm pretty good at being a cynic. You wouldn't know this, but in my senior class back in Gaston, Alabama, when they gave out superlatives, I got the superlative of having the smartest mouth, and that was not based on intellect. <laughs> that was an Alabama smart mouth. And it's still there. I try to tame it, and a lot of stuff stops right behind my teeth, but it's still there, and I can wallow in some, in some cynicism and some sarcasm. Sometimes maybe you have to just for the sake of sanity, but I tell you what, if you go down deep in that hole because you start off as a young child trusting everybody, and then your parents spend 20 years trying to teach you that everybody's not trustworthy. And a lot of times you end up at the end of this game trusting nobody. <clears throat> Unfortunately, relationships are built on trust, and we've all seen it. Where at the end of the game, when you land there, you trust nobody. You also relate to nobody. And you're right, and you're sharp. And you can tear the heck out of every decision that's ever been made in the last 80 years of your life got no relationship. And like, I, I beat on that drum a little bit because I can go there. I can get there easily and so could you. So here we are. We're cynics. We're in a cynical world. We're in this place where everybody hates change and hates the way things are. What are we supposed to do? I'll tell you what we're supposed to do. 
We're supposed to lead courageously lest we leave everybody else to wallow in the mud of cynicism. We've got to be courageous leaders. We've got to lead courageously in our homes, in our community, in our churches, in our government, in our businesses. We have to be courageous leaders. And to be courageous today means you're going to put yourself out there and you're going to make decisions and you're going to make statements and you're going to give directives and you're going to start businesses and you're going to go forward and you're going to put a big bullseye on your back, but you're not going to fear it because the alternative is to be passive and regretful. If you're going to lead today, you better be ready for criticism. If you're going to lead today, you better muster up your courage. But if you walk away from that, if you walk away from that, you're on a long, slow road to regret. Might be safe, probably more lucrative, full of regret. Leadership has been placed in you, you must lead. You must lead because we need you to lead. We need courageous leaders. And a lot of them are in this room. So how do you lead in a cynical world? How do you not worry about the bullets? How do you dodge the Facebook reviews? How do, you, how do you live in this new wild west where everybody gets a voice whether or not they're in touch with reality or not? Let me give you a few ideas. I don't know if these are the best ideas. These are just my ideas. If you got some better, please send them to me. Number one, as a leader, don't try to convince the cynic. It's not your job to convince the cynic. Cynics are always going to be there. They've always been there. Read the history books. I mean, they go all the way back to the garden. The cynic is always there. And a lot of times you try to convince the cynic, don't try to convince the cynic. Just move. They say that in businesses, I read this stat not long ago, some of you guys probably familiar with this, that in your business, about 30% of your employees are really engaged in what you're doing. They got the weight on their shoulders, they're listening, and they're driving this train forward. About 50% of your employees, they show up and get their stuff done. They're not positive, they're not negative, they're neutral. They do what they do. About 20% of your employees actively resist. They just actively resist no matter what you do. You can't focus on the 20%. The way you move your business forward is you grab the 30%, you love on the 50%. You grab the 30% and you go and you ignore the 20%. It's not going to move. It's not your job to move the cynic. A lot of time and energy wasted trying to convert the cynic. And I've been the cynic. You can't convert. Just move. Illustration. You're a jockey. You know, you talk about investing. Everybody goes, don't, don't bet on the horse, bet on the jockey. This is business for betting on the jockey. We're jockeys. We're jockeys. And you get on your horse, and if you're a jockey and you're getting on your horse, the cynics are the flies. And they want to buzz around, and they want to get in your head, and they want to cause you to be distracted. But if you're a jockey and you're about to run a race, you better be looking at your speed. You better be watching the course. You better be thinking about turn four. You better be looking at your competition. I mean, we can't imagine one of these jockeys climbing into that gate and getting on their horse and swatting flies. He's got this big stick. He's going to beat the horse wheel around turn four. I mean, he is focused. He doesn't have time for the flies. The flies are the cynics. I'm sure they're there. Wherever there's horses, there's flies. Don't pay attention to the flies. Focus on the race. If the flies are really buzzing around you, driving you crazy, just remind yourself that as you run the race, when you get done, you're either going to be in the winner's circle or you're going to be down there with the jockeys who actually ran the race. And all the flies are going to go where flies go and they're going to be on a big pile of steaming hot manure. That's where they all land. You run your race. Don't let the flies knock you down. Check out this, uh, this quote. Teddy Roosevelt, great, great quote. You might have heard it before. A little long, but uh, it's worth reading. You got it for me, Connor? It says, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. 
but who does actually strive to do the deeds. Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. Key little word here, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Like, that's scary. It's scary that, that I could become a cynic all my life, and I could cast judgment on everything everybody does, but at the end of the day, my uniform's not dirty. I mean, it's a great time to be a late-night talk show host, right? I mean, I could be a screenwriter for Saturday Night Live right now. The stories they just write themselves. It's, I'm not saying there's nothing not there's nothing to be cynical about. There's plenty to be cynical about. But you gotta guard your soul. You want to lead out of it. Just for fun, I'm gonna try to counteract all this goodness you guys laid out. I was thinking about some of the cynical stuff. Did y'all watch the uh, the Hall of Fame recently in, in the NFL Hall of Fame? They inducted all the players. And everybody went to Canton, and they had this great thing. And T.O., Terrell Owens, he had his own thing. He's like, I'm not going there. 50 years of tradition. Like, y'all can have that. I'm going to go down here and do mine in Chattanooga. And he had his own ceremony, his own induction. And, and I did not watch what he said, but I did see a clip, and it was really comical because he proudly said, I am a humble man. <laughs> I was like, T.O., man. First off, if you're humble, the last thing you would ever say is, I'm humble. <laughs> Anybody ever self-proclaims they're either beautiful or humble? They're neither. You can count on that. <laughs> it's not something you say about yourself. We were sitting down. I held a gun to your head and said, give me 100 adjectives to describe T.O. Humble would make the list. But, you know, we live in a cynical place. In the political realm, I was looking at this not long ago. It struck me. Uh, we're probably mostly fiscally conservative in here. I'm 48 years old. I know I look 20. I'm really 48, all right? In my lifetime, in my lifetime, the federal government has either balanced the budget or had a surplus four years. Four out of 48. Fiscal conservatism is a great campaign slogan somebody talks about. It's never going to happen. <laughs> four out of 48? It's worse now than it's ever been. Oh, there's plenty to be cynical about. Don't let your heart just die in cynicism. It's a bad death. Number two, if you're going to lead in this place, be a courageous leader. That's what you need to do. Embrace the inherent goodness of failure because failure has the patent on humility. Embrace the inherent goodness of failure because failure has the patent on humility. You've never learned humility through success. Success is great. It's much better than failure. In some ways. But if all you do is win all your life, then you're going to be one arrogant leader. I don't care who you are. There's just no way around. It's just human nature. If you just win all the time, you're never going to learn humility. The only way to learn humility is by failure, by losing. <coughs> Derek Dooley was uh, the coach of Tennessee for about five years. He's up in Missouri now. I read an article, came out with this article recently. You know, his dad's Vince Dooley. This, this Hall of Fame coach, AD, he got ushered into coaching, went, got a law school degree, was AD, was killing it at high rise, went to Tennessee. Unfortunately, Tennessee has to play Alabama every year, and it was just kind of his downfall, right? <laughs> he had a rough five years. But he wrote, and he said recently, as he goes up there to the OC, he says, best thing ever happened in my life. So I've never done anything but one. It's like 32. I was there. I, I didn't know how to do these things. I'm so glad that happened in my life because failure has the patent on teaching humility. Don't fear it. Embrace it. Go through it. Because as, as a younger man, I didn't want to fail at anything. As a little bit older man, the thing I fear most is that fear of failure will cap what I could actually do. Because there's some things I'll never accomplish if I don't fail. If you go through all your life and all you do is succeed, you left half of your capacity on the table because you never stretched yourself. Listen to this great quote. Great quote by uh, J. 
John Wooden, thanks coach, said, don't permit fear of failure to prevent effort. We are all imperfect and will on occasions and will fail on occasions. But fear of failure is the greatest failure of all. And we've all heard that put in a lot of different ways. I'm not going to beat that drum. But there is this realization that until you've stretched enough to fail, you've never figured out what your capacity is. But in a cynical world where everybody's sitting by their mouse and their laptop just waiting for you to fail so they can pounce, just waiting on you to make a bad decision so they can feel some type of self-righteousness about pointing out your bad decision, where every failure is a public failure, where the video cuts are always there, fear for us and for the generations coming behind that the internet trolls and the cynicism of our environment will stifle our ability to take great risk. Let it not be. Let's go get it. Let's not fear failure. Failure is not a wall, it's a stepping stone. Move through it. It's the only way to find your limits. Much I can say about that, let me move on. Number three, you're going to lead in this crazy environment of cynicism. You're going to have to relentlessly battle cynicism first in your own soul, then in your home, then in your company, then in your family, then in society. You're going to have to battle. It's not going anywhere. It's in your DNA. You may not have got the award for the smartest mouth as a senior, but you have somewhat of a smart mouth. Whether or not it comes out or not, cynicism lives in our DNA. I consider it like the flesh-eating bacteria. That stuff, when it gets inside of you, for some reason it starts eating away at the extremities. It starts chopping fingers off and hands off, trying to get ahead of it. It eats away at the extremities because it's on its way to the vital organs to kill you. Cynicism is that. It's on its way to kill you. And so you're never going to rid it out of your system. If you do figure that out, I'll pay you a lot of money to teach me how to do that. The best you can do is fight it in the extremities. Keep it at bay. Hold it off. And it's a lifelong fight. The way we fight it, though, is we do what these guys, we, we never coordinate. We just show up. You tell great stories of hope. Hope is kryptonite to cynicism. Stories of hope are kryptonite to cynicism. Courageous leaders of today, we must be the best storytellers in our communities, in our families, in our churches, and we must tell great stories of hope. There's an old saying that says, everybody finds what you're looking for. If you're looking for what's wrong, you'll find it. If you're looking for what's right, you'll find it. Think about your office, your workplace. There's somebody in your office, in your workplace, every time they walk in, well, they're looking for what's wrong, right? They're sitting at your table, just sit real still. <laughs> Don't point it out. There's somebody that walks in and always looking for what's wrong. And you walk in any workplace, any of our workplaces, you find stuff that's wrong, right? I'm an engineer, I'm analytical, sometimes I'm that guy. And then there's other people that walk in workplaces and they're looking for what's right. They're usually your sales guys, right? I mean, they get turned down 99 times without any loss of enthusiasm. They, they always look for what's right. I always got to be paired with one of those guys. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just devolve down in everything that's wrong. We got to tell great stories of hope. Because it's kryptonite to cynicism in my heart, in your heart, in our society, in the crazy internet world that we live in. It is the antidote. Let me give you a few examples. I was thinking about stories of great hope when I was leading here at Radius. I read this a long time ago. It made all the sense in the world to me. You do not teach your children morality by saying lying is bad and telling the truth is wrong. You don't teach your kids morality by going sharing is good and being selfish is wrong. Those are kind of outside, ethereal, philosophical concepts. They don't land. They don't mean anything. I mean, they mean, there's statements, you know, you, you could argue about them in philosophy class in college. They do not lead people to goodness and morality. You know what leads your children and 
I would argue us as well to goodness and morality is hearing, seeing, observing, being taught, watching great men and women do great things and being so inspired by what they did, we desperately want to emulate them. Children learn morality through emulation. I would argue adults do too. We watch this like, I want to do some of that. And that's how we conquer this cynicism is we have to tell these stories. We have to live these stories. And then people want to emulate that. That's the reason why throughout history you have all these stories of Washington and the cherry tree and telling the truth. It's not the truth is good and lies are bad. It's look at this person who told the truth and became great. Honest Abe walking through the night handing back the money that was accidentally taken in the store. Look at this man who became such a great name of honesty. He didn't have a lot of other advantages in life. He was just honest. And over time, through his failures, through his losses, his strength of honesty was like a veritable water force coming against the dam that couldn't be held back and it swooped him into the presence. Tell great stories of hope. Your children will be inspired, you will be inspired, we will all be better, we will stem the tide of cynicism in our society and in our own souls. So when I get done wrong, <coughs> you get done wrong, let's tell ourselves the story of MLK. In my home state of Montgomery, Alabama, people firebomb this house. And all we had to do is stand on the porch and go fight on. Load up. But he did. That's, that's inspiring. I don't think I could do that. I wish I could do that. I'd like to say I think I could do that. That's legacy. Think about uh, Gandhi and, and the Muslims and the Hindus killing each other. And, and we watch, you know, we watch the alt right and the Antifa this past week fight in the streets or. You know, just pick it out. You pick two groups fighting, and they were fighting and killing each other all over India. And Gandhi took the humble road and said, I'm not going to eat until everybody quits spilling blood. Like it seems so far out in today's world, but it hits me at a deeper level. It squashes my cynicism. I think about Bill Gates. Everybody's kind of forgot about Bill Gates. I think he's still the richest man in the world. He's okay. So Gates is uh, Gates started the movement to give half his wealth away. I think he's convinced almost a hundred gazillionaires give half their wealth away before the end of their life. Buffett and all the guys. I'm hoping to join that group, but <laughs> <laughs> anybody wants to help me get there, uh, I'm gonna be cynical about it. <laughs> great stories. It's the great stories of, of faith doing what they do. It's the great stories of you guys doing what you do. That's how we defeat census. I have three daughters. Uh, one of them's here today with her mom. I have uh, two others. When my daughters were second grade, fourth grade, and sixth grade, my sixth grader was playing her first year of club volleyball. And so you've experienced that, you have the ringing in the ears and the, uh, the memories of all that, it's great times. She's playing her very first year, she was playing on sixth grade team and seventh grade team, won some kind of tournament, and, and they were going to Reno, Nevada to play in this next tournament the seventh grade team was. So a seventh grade coach came and asked, hey, can you send your daughter to Reno to play in this tournament? Carrie and I were young, we didn't have two nickels to rub together, like no. <laughs> we don't can't pay for that. Not happy. Well, we'll pay. We'll pay for everything there if you can just get there. All right. I still can't pay for that, but I do have frequent flyer miles because I was globe trotting at that time and I was minister mission. Had a ton of frequent flyer miles, so her and Carrie decided to go. She's sixth grader. She gets to play up on seventh grade team. Big deal. And so. We were, I forget the exact scenario, it tells you how old I am, but we had to come up with some funds for the trip. We, I guess we had to pay hotel and food or something like that. Maybe five, six hundred bucks. 
And so uh, Lena had a little bit of money, maybe a hundred or something from grandparents. And I was like, I'll, I'll kick in a hundred bucks, I think. I think that's all I could bring. I'm kicking in a hundred. You guys spend everything you got and we'll, we'll see if we make this thing work. And then her fourth grade sister, who had like 125 bucks, let's say, somewhere around there. 125 bucks comes down the steps. We're talking one night, and she brings 125 bucks, gives it to her six-year-old sister, sixth grade sister, and says, I want you to use this for the term. It was like, it was this surreal moment in my life because that's just who my middle daughter is, and so I was ultimately proud. I was also ultimately ashamed because she outgave me. <laughs> I'm serious. It was like this weird sense of emotion. I was like, that's all dang. <laughs> I mean, this, I hadn't spoken about 15 years. It's hard to say. She, she outgave me. And, and I gave 100, and, you know, ties were tight. She gave everything. Everything. Didn't think about it. Wanted to. Wanted to launch her sister. Saw opportunity in this person's lives. Saw a higher ceiling. Just loved them. Just wanted to give something. I'm over here. I'm the engineer. I count stuff out. But we can afford this. It's embarrassing. I'm over it. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> You got somebody that's playing volleyball and needs to go somewhere, you let me know. I'm going to make it up, all right? <laughs> but listen, here, here's the moral of the story. Is that people out there have potential. And when people have potential, somebody's got to come along. And somebody's got to overcome cynicism. And somebody's got to sacrifice. And somebody's got to <coughs> elevate them. And that becomes this great story of hope that squelches all cynicism in our own souls and out there and gives us the ability to be courageous leaders. Her sister went on and played volleyball at the University of Ole Miss. I'm not gonna connect the dots, but I will connect this dot. That I do know that athletics is mostly between the ears and just the confidence, getting over the hump of being called up and playing that, it, it's the first step. It's a great step. We gotta be those people. We gotta be courageous leaders. We're jockeys. Get on our horses. Focus on the track. Look at the competition. Watch our steed. When the flies fly around, remember they are heading for the dung pile. Don't let them convince you to do otherwise. But be great storytellers. Great storytellers lead people to do great things. A lot of great people in this room and a lot of great storytellers. I appreciate you guys having me here. I want our legacy collectively to be the people who stem the great tide of cynicism in our society and elevate the next generation to believe. So when you leave here and you go back to your office, look for what somebody's doing right. And when you go home, don't be outgiven by your 10-year-old daughter. <laughs> This is embarrassing. Sacrifice to do what's right. Thank you guys.